Once again, my name is Roland Woodward, Chairman of the Keepers of the Athabasca. And uh, I'm really grateful that we uh, co-hosted this conference with Treaty 8 and with the University of Alberta because it brought a lot of people together from different parts and it we got a lot of information out of it and we're starting to look towards the future for that I'm very thankful and uh, we'll uh, sort of start off on my left is uh, Dr. John O'Connor uh, Helene Walsh and Mary Richardson, and they'll be speaking in in order. Uh, Dr. O'Connor first. I uh, will try and uh, keep uh, the uh, questions towards the end. But if we have to ask some, then then we'll stop and ask questions. Thank you, John. I'll just sit here, I guess. Um, yeah, my name is John O'Connor. I've worked in the uh, area downstream of the tar sands. For, this is my 20th year. Um, I'm a family physician, and um, uh, up to a few years ago, it was, you know, just that. But um, uh, the government, actually, I'm grateful to for uh, converting me to a, an, ad an adversary and an activist and a commie, pinko, green, uh, green piecer. Etc. We we've had years of claims of world class monitoring and regulations, and successive ministers, um, you know, in person and on video, saying that there's no imp no adverse, no evidence of any adverse impacts of the tar sands whatsoever. Of course, nobody listened to people living downstream, in in the uh, area that. Um, some people call the sacrificial zone. Uh, traditional knowledge actually le led the way to spotlight what was and is very plain to smell, see, hear, taste, and feel. Uh, eventually, independent science called the lie to what the government uh, was trying to claim uh, with a series of uh, very elegant and uh, undeniable uh, studies that uh, you know, laid, laid bare the impact of this industry. So this led to this independent monitoring panel to set up an independent monitoring program. I, it's, it's sort of weird because we trust that the likes of Peter Kent, uh, Joe Oliver, Stephen Harper, and then more locally, um, the likes of the, the, minist the ministers of environment and energy. And, uh, a government in Edmonton that in 2007 appointed Heather Kennedy, a vice president of Suncor, to be the assistant deputy minister in charge of the oil sands, while she was still a VP of Suncor. You know, the interests of the shareholders, apparently the same as the interests of people, uh, of the people of Alberta. I don't think so. So anyway, this uh, monitoring panel was set up um, and Ernest Huey, I believe, is the CEO of monitoring programs in the province. I was snuck into a meeting of SEMA a few weeks ago. Um, Ernest was there to uh, talk about or around the government's plan. Didn't really say very much. But one thing he did say, which drew gasps from the audience, was that in his estimation, Alberta has excellent war, water and air monitoring programs. If we have excellent programs, what the hell are we doing setting up a world-class monitoring program for? I, I would severely doubt the independence of this. And, and as time has dragged on, I mean, it's way overdue now, given the initial timelines that we were given. I, I cannot see it. I, I don't have any um, hope that we're going to see anything that uh, amounts to what we need. In the Fort Mackay area, um, the experience there, where, where I'm health director, um, is also very obvious. Uh, with the loss of land, loss of access to foods, loss of clean air, loss of reliable clean water, and of course, the boomtown effect, which has uh, ripped into the social fabric and the family fabric of the community. 
and, and of course set up uh, our own local version of Dutch disease. We recently even heard, uh, and again talking about monitoring, we heard about uh, the fact that acid rain is now 20 times what it was a few years ago. We had Shell, I believe, requesting that the government uh, exempt an area 100 kilometers north, or up to 100 kilometers north of Fort McMurray uh, to treat it differently in terms of uh, the, the constituents of acid rain. Haven't heard the government saying no to that yet. So we've got a grotesque situation now where we've got the people of Canada and NGOs versus the industrial government complex that exists in Canada defending, or, or we're defending the land which is under assault from this complex. How did this come about? I don't know. It, w it wasn't the Canada that I read about as a kid uh, and came over to in 1984, that's for sure. The health issues that have uh, been obvious downstream have never been studied. Um, it's a, a bizarre situation uh, given the fact that, for instance, the Alberta Cancer Board spent a year studying cancers in Fort Chip, and after their study, strongly suggested and recommended that a, a comprehensive health study be done of the community of Fort Chip. A few weeks ago, we had uh, Leona Aglukak uh, in you know, very public um, statements say that the government is going to undertake uh, health studies to look into the potential or possible health impacts of windmills. Obviously, Fort Chip would have been a hell of a lot better off if it had been downstream from a wind farm. So f from the public health standpoint, we hear nothing, absolutely nothing. Public health officials in this province are, are silent, uh, basically waiting on their political masters to tell them when to speak or not to speak. But there is, in, in the ethics of, of sort of the area of public health, uh, there are a number of, of issues that are being avoided. Um, for instance, the, o the onus is not on us, not on physicians to prove that a certain type of activity is a hazard to health. The onus is on the uh, perpetrators and the facilitators and supporters of this kind of, of activity to prove that it isn't. No, nobody is trumpeting that, and they should be. And then the, in the area of the precautionary principle, you know, if, if there's a risk that something could impact land, environment, or people, then it, the risk should be mitigated People should be removed from that area to avoid being impacted. And again, that doesn't exist in this province, n nor probably in this country, for that matter. So from the, the government, uh, industry government complex, it's been uh, traditionally, and especially in the north, a case of you work with us or else. Um, unfortunately, we're in a situation now where many are dependent on a single industry that serves as a source of the wherewithal to keep body and soul together and a means to separate them. A, a very catch-22 situation. From my perspective, um, we can't, n none of us, and especially any of us involved in, in um, advocacy or healthcare, can't afford to stop. You know, I as bleak as, as what it is and, and as tough as what it is for some people, um, you know, and it's being made more and more difficult, we can't afford to hesitate, because if we do, they win. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Helene Walsh with Keepers of the Athabasca. Very proud to be a member of that group. I've been a member of other groups, and they're not nearly as good, so I would encourage you to, <laughs> en encourage you to, to join us, if you will. Um, I have a kind of a weird history, and... Uh, I can explain all, I have reasons for everything I've done, um, but I'm not going to discuss them here. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, a couple years ago, I, I really got, in, you know, into it and really studied the situation in Alberta's tar sands, and these are kind of my conclusions. Um, hmm. So, uh, about seven years ago I, I joined the Cumulative Environmental Management Association and people have questioned that and why I haven't left yet but uh, maybe there's some reasons here why I haven't. Anyway, uh, 
the Cumulative Environment Management Association is a, a multi-stakeholder society that industry and government set up to overlook the development of the tar sands and ensure it's done properly and uh, to make recommendations to the government to manage the cumulative environmental effects. And so uh, I thought, well, that's, that's a worthy thing to do. When I joined, they were doing uh, land use planning. We took two years and I think a million dollars and we developed a kind of a rough land use plan. We submitted it to government. And, and this means industry supported it, right? Submitted it to government and uh, they put it on a shelf and they said, oh, we've got this new plan coming up. We'll certainly take your ideas into consideration, but we've got a new plan coming up. And that was the, you know, the LARP is, is the result of that. So we've been talking about a, a lot about cumulative environmental management, cumulative effects. And uh, what that means is, it's simply if you have one project in an area, well, it has an impact on the environment. You have, if you have two, well, it has a different impact on the environment. And once you have a whole bunch, you might say, I wonder if the impacts are too high. So there, there's a cutoff, right? And you've you got to do some careful measuring of whatever factors you're concerned about to make sure you're not exceeding some kind of threshold. You're not exceeding the ability of the environment to recover based on what you've been doing. And, and, uh, and so that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be managing our cumulative effects because that's the way we can, uh, that's called sustainable development. It means we can develop, but we're looking after the other things as well. So that's a worthy thing to do. In the tar sands area, oddly, in, uh, I, th I think this is so funny. Uh, the First Nations and Métis, of course, for years, for years, have been telling people, you know, things aren't looking the same here. Things are different now. And they had various examples of it. And uh, it was, but it wasn't until uh, the Western science came in and actually, you know, measured some of these things that, that's kind of obvious to most of us. You know, industry is saying, well, the, uh, the environment in the Athabasca River, you got these tar sands, the river goes through it, and so naturally there's contamination. And they've been insisting that uh, there are no, no environmental effects as a result of the development. And when I go through or walk through and the healing walk, when I walk through that area and I see all the stuff coming out of the smokestacks and the stuff going off the ponds and the wind blowing the sediments around, and I'm thinking, well, there's got to be some kind of effect. I mean, you can see it, right? But no, it's, it, don't worry about that. It's the stuff you can't see. It's those natural deposits in the river and, you know, that are, that are leaking into the environment. And when they do, when they, the monitoring body was doing their measurements, and I still can't quite believe this, so maybe it isn't true, they weren't measuring the right stuff. So tar sands emit certain pollutants, right? Pulp mills emit different things. They were still monitoring what the pulp mills were emitting and not what the tar sands were emitting. So then they didn't find any harmful effects. That's, that's handy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm uh, sitting on SEMA with Aboriginal people and with uh, other environmental people and government and industry. Um, we're asking, well, you know, there's all these obvious things. Uh, aren't they having an effect? And we would, uh, they would keep saying, no, it's all natural. And then uh, the ramp, which is the big body that does all the so-called monitoring was reviewed by a government, bunch of government people, independent though, and they said there's all these problems with RAMP. This monitoring is not being done properly, and it, you wouldn't be able to determine if there were, were effects from this industry because they're not measuring the right things. <coughs> and then, uh, but when when we specifically asked about that study. They would say, oh, all, all those problems have been fixed. And so there wasn't really anything a person could do to prove that they were wrong. That was so frustrating because it was obvious that they were wrong, but they kept insisting, so what can you do? And then the Royal Society of Canada in 2010 was asked by the government to do a review of the oil sands. 
and uh, they had an enormous study, but one of the key things they found to me was there is important lack of cumulative analysis. They, they identified in 2010 that cumulative effects were not being monitored. And so then, well, I'm thinking, you know, that's better. I mean, environmental groups have been saying this for years, but here we have the Royal Society saying that. And there were five, five other studies in quick succession that said basically the same thing. Uh, there was another review of RAMP. The one in 2004 was replaced by this one. I don't know if the people were the same, but they certainly found the same results. RAMP does not monitor aquatic environments in the oil sands region to detect and assess cumulative effects and regional trends. And that's what they were supposed to do. And the Auditor General of Canada in 2011 essentially said the same thing. Fisheries and Oceans Canada and Environment Canada have not been able to consider in a thorough and systematic manner the cumulative environmental effects of oil sands projects in that region due to lack of information. Now these are, and, and two other big studies showed the similar stuff. And uh, when I think of, you know, all the opposition to tar sands mining and pipelines and so on, and government calling those people uh, radicals and anti-Canadian and so on. Uh, and here they have all these independent, uh, you know, people, uh, respected people coming to the same conclusion, essentially. But they, d they ignore that, of course. So then I thought, well, what are the actual rules around oil sands development? What is, what is supposed to prevent this from happening? And so I looked into the rules of the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, and apparently it's required. Environmental effects of the project, including any cumulative environmental effects that are likely to result from the project in combination with other projects or activities that have been or will be carried out. All that's supposed to be considered, not just the projects that are already there, but the projects that are anticipated for the future. Well, that's a pretty high standard. Um, you know, if that was actually done, that would have made a big difference. And then Alberta has an Environmental Protection Enhancement Act, and you look into that, and again, cumulative effects are supposed to be included. A description of potential positive and negative environmental, social, economic, and cultural impacts of the proposed activity, including cumulative, regional, temporal, and spatial considerations. And then finally, we have the, the body that actually does the approvals, and they have a, a strong statement too. No oil sands project in, any Alberta, in Alberta may proceed without an assessment of cumulative effects. And yet, five independent panels said, we're not assessing the cumulative effects. So this was kind of, well, astounding to me. I mean, I've heard how governments ignore the treaty rights and so on, and, and that's appalling. And, uh, but I'm thinking, and they also ignore their own rules. Well, certainly, you'd think we could do something about it then. Doesn't, doesn't anybody care? So I was all excited, and I said, I'll take this to myself. I'll take this to SEMA, Cumulative Environmental Effects Monitoring Association. I'll give, uh, give them this information. And uh, surely they will recommend to government, because that's our job, that we have a pause in development until we know the cumulative effects. And, uh, but before I did that, I thought, well, I should find, I knew that Schindler had done some work, and I knew about the odd other study, but I thought, well, I wonder if other people have done some work that I haven't really even heard about. And I, I simply searched on internet, and I was able to find not only Western knowledge in scientific papers, but also Aboriginal communities had started writing their own reports, and I was able to access those. So instead of just being able to, you know, hearing it from people, I was able to actually document what was being said by the First Nations and Métis people. And as you've been hearing, there's a lot of problems. So huge land state disturbance, whether it's mining or in situ, Deformed fish was one of the first things that, that Aboriginal people had picked up on. 
Rivers, lakes, and ponds with less water. Well, that's a problem. Wildlife declines, most notable in caribou, but caribou is really one of the few species we actually study. What about everything else? The wetlands that can't be reclaimed because it's just too complicated. The toxic tailings ponds that leak, polluted groundwater, air pollution, including acid rain, and increases in toxins. And there's, you know, there's a whole bunch more stuff too. So, gosh, uh, as you noted with Simon's slides, and, and this is a similar one, the black, the black is w the projects that are already built. And then there's a little one about uh, projects in progress. That's the next, next line. And then the, the solid gray is projects that have been approved. So, so we were thinking that, uh, you know, there shouldn't be any more approvals. But you look at that graph, they've already approved twice as many as are already in existence. And we already have all these problems. So it's not enough just to ask for no new approvals. We've got to ask for no new projects. If it's not being built, don't build it. So I took that recommendation to SEMA and I said this is the basis for my uh, what we're thinking and uh, it seemed like it was kind of I mean I knew they wouldn't be happy about it but I thought well given our what we're supposed to do how can they how can they say no hmm. some of my slides are, seem to be missing anyway sure enough they did say no of course and they said, well, w you can take it, you know, you can tell government about it. I said, well, well, you know, Premier Redford is still going around the, the planet saying uh, our tar sands are being developed re sustainably, responsibly, that we're managing for cumulative effects, and she needs to know that actually this isn't true, because I'm sure she doesn't want to go around lying about things. And, uh, <laughs> and they didn't see that point of view. <laughs> uh, they're very afraid, I see, that, you know, that they, that they would have to recommend such a thing and, and of course, the province wouldn't be happy about that. So, uh, so, so I did take it to the media and maybe the timing was wrong, but the media ignored it too and some of them said, you know, Helene, this isn't new. And I'm thinking, well, I mean, I, I think it is sort of. I mean, I don't think Alberta citizens know that we're actually breaking our own laws in uh, in this in developing this resource, but who am I? And uh, so I sort of have given up for a while, but I think there are opportunities. And and what I did want to focus on is at the end is that it is it does seem very dismal and sad. And uh, but what I found out in some of my reading is that if you stop polluting it can improve over time. But the more pollution you have, the more problems you have, the longer it's going to take. So if we're, if we're looking to the future, short term, we really need to demand that they stop building new projects. That's the only thing I can think of that, you know, will, will slow the damage and then give us time, I hope, to, uh, to fix some of the problems. And uh, to me, that's key. I just don't know, and I know there's a lot of people who would agree, I just don't know how we indicate that if the public is knowledgeable about what's happening, they're going to they're gonna support no new projects. But how do we make that happen? And so I'm hoping maybe that in the discussion following, give us some ideas, because uh, I think this would be a real eye-opener for people. But how do you get them the message if the media won't cover it, if the government won't be honest? It's, uh, it's a pretty tough, tough situation. Thanks. Uh, my name is Mary Richardson. I'm a charter member of the Keepers of the Athabasca. And uh, one of the issues that the Keepers uh, are working on is the effects of oil sands projects, particularly SAG D, on groundwater in the Athabasca River Basin. SAG-D and, as we heard earlier, SAG-D and other in situ methods will soon produce more bitumen than traditional mining methods. 
and there are currently approximately 14 applications for new or expanded projects undergoing environmental assessment by Alberta Environment. People in the North understand that aquifers play a vital role in the water cycle, that they are connected. Sorry, I must not be holding this right. Is that better? Thanks, sorry, I'm very sorry. Uh, aquifers play a vital role in the water cycle, that they're connected to surface water and wetlands, and that what happens underground is just as important and just as risk prone as what we can see above ground. We heard excellent presentations earlier today by Bill Donahue, Lee Foote, and Simon Dyer that explained our concerns very clearly. Last August, the provincial government published the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan, or LARP, which includes a management framework for groundwater. So we wondered what protection it would offer for groundwater. I will argue in this short presentation that it does not offer any protection at all at present because the elements of the management framework are not well enough developed to be implemented. It offers only promises about what will happen in the future and nothing about what will happen right now to protect groundwater while licenses to operate are being granted at an ever-increasing pace. LARP identifies both quality and quantity objectives that the province want to achieve. The quality piece is that groundwater quality is protected from contamination. And the quantity piece is that groundwater continues to support human and ecosystem needs and the integrity of the regional flow system is maintained. So at least lip service is being paid to groundwater flow in this version of the plan. It intends to meet these objectives. It offers only promises about what will happen in the future. <laughs> and nothing about what will happen now to protect groundwater while licenses to operate are being granted at an ever-increasing pace. Uh, the gr the, manage the um, groundwater management framework, which is part of LARP, uh, is supposed to be designed in such a way as to account, take into account cumulative effects of multiple developments. So again, at least lip service is being paid to cumulative impacts. The, th the framework includes three elements. The first is indicators, triggers, and limits. The second is model modeling and monitoring to assess the quality and quantity of groundwater. And the third is management and adaptation, which means the actions that will be taken if problems are detected. So it's, sound, it's sounding, you know, half decent, uh, but I will consider each of these elements and show that none of them can be implemented at this point. And my argument isn't uh, based on interpretation or analysis. I just simply rely on direct quotes from the documents to make my case. So we'll start with indicators, triggers, and limits. Indicators provide information about whether quality and quantity objectives are being met. For quality, there's such things as, say, the levels of benzene or arsenic in the groundwater that go beyond what is naturally occurring. And for quantity, there's such things as changes in groundwater levels in an aquifer and in connected water bodies or wetlands. Triggers can be thought of as yellow lights. Caution is required because the system is coming close to limits beyond which it cannot go without significant harm. The purpose of triggers is to prevent the system from being polluted up to the limit, the red light. Triggers and limits will be developed for both individual projects and for three regions in the oil sands area. 
the North Athabasca, the South Athabasca, and the Cold Lake Beaver River areas. The site-specific triggers and limits will be developed under the province's regulatory system using a yet-to-be-written guidance document for groundwater management plans for in-situ operations. So you see all of these things are just promissory notes. They're nothing that can actually ha be ha happening yet. So far, regional indicators have been set for groundwater quality and quantity. Interim triggers have been set for quality, but not for quantity. No limits whatsoever have been set for either quality or quantity. Clearly, if there are no final triggers and limits, no action to correct problems can be required under the plan. In fact, you can't even identify <laughs> problems under the plan because no limits are set. In other words, the plan cannot be implemented. LARP makes this clear itself when it says, while interim regional triggers have been developed, a management response will not be a mandatory requirement of the regional plan until there is better understanding of the current state of groundwater in the region and final triggers and limits have been established. Why can't triggers and limits be set yet? Because our knowledge of the hydrogeology of the region and the second element of the management plan, monitoring and modeling, are not yet sufficiently developed. The groundwater, as I say, I'm taking this straight from the documents, the groundwater framework says a regional monitoring network, ground, sorry, groundwater monitoring network will be implemented and maintained as part of the management system to provide assurance that cumulative effects are not occurring or are appropriately addressed. It will be used to establish regional triggers and limits for the regional aquifers in each of the three groundwater management areas using data collected at new and existing monitoring locations. And also, given the current understanding of the region's complex hydrogeology, it is too early in the process to establish numerical, numerical limits. As such, an approach to setting limits, not just setting limits, an approach to setting limits will be developed in the future to meet the goals of this framework. The methodologies that will be used in the establishment of the final regional triggers and limits will be confirmed as the process to complete the management framework continues. Now you might wonder how it will be determined whether triggers and limits have been exceeded in a region, not just in a, in a specific project, but in a region, say, would it be if one regional monitoring site surpasses triggers or limits? Would it be if the majority or all of the sites surpass their triggers and limits? I can't find an answer to this question in the plan, but it does talk briefly about identifying aquifers with a higher priority for protection. Were any of us consulted about that? Uh, and monitoring wells identified as representative of regional quality. How? I don't know. Um, well, I think you can see that there is a long way to go before the regional monitoring systems are in place and operating long enough such that final triggers and limits could be set and thus before the third element of the framework, management and adaptation, that is actually doing something about the problems, can be implemented when necessary. It really does appear that the groundwater framework was rushed to press before it was ready. I just want to make one more point about management actions to be taken if triggers or limits are found to have been exceeded, you know, s when this actually does happen sometime in the future. According to the groundwater framework, if investigation confirms that action is needed, then 
a mitigation phase is initiated to identify the operations responsible and the kind of management actions required. At this stage, op uh, options for engineering controls, risk-based approaches, or modification of operations, so there is some at least lip service again uh, paid to modification of operations. Uh, if the desired outcome is achieved by the, mod by the mitigation methods put in place, the event is closed. If not, supplemental mitigation and assessment is required until the defined outcome is achieved. The time between mitigation and closure can be lengthy. Again, I think you can just feel time passing while groundwater quality and quantity are suffering. And I hope that you'll take my presentation together with Helene Walsh's and consider the necessity to declare a moratorium on new oil sands projects until we are in a position to determine cumulative effects and have a better idea Thank you. Oh, that's my final sentence. And have a better idea of how to prevent harm. That time seems a long way off. Thank you.